Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Lisa Greenhill, and I'm the Associate Executive Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. So today's show um, is devoted to exploring diversity through the lens of public practice. My guests today are Dr. Rachel Cesar from USDA and Dr. Valerie Reagan from Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. Unfortunately, Dr. Reagan is having some internet issues, so she will be joining us a little bit later in the show. Um, but uh, for now, we will have a really great chat with uh, Rachel and um, find out a little bit about what she's doing um, at USDA and uh, what um, she uh, has to share with us. So um, Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. So um, as we do on the show, I'd like my guests to share a bit about their background and their career path. So why don't we uh, get started? Okay, great. So basically, um, I am with USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, and I am actually um, in the Riverdale, Maryland area, which is right outside of Washington, DC. Um, I've been here in this area since 2007. Um, before then, I actually was in the Michigan area um, as a veterinary medical officer with USDA. So now um, I am actually a director uh, for the animal imports, all the live animal imports for the country. Uh, I basically have 11 on my staff. Um, eight of them are other veterinarians that are in charge of their, their specific areas, specific commodities, equine, cattle, swine, avian. Um, basically, I'm just ensuring that all the animals that are getting imported are going to be disease free as much as possible and being handled humanely. Um, it's a very interesting program that I'm in. I actually just started in this position beginning around this, this year. Um, before then, I was actually working in more of the animal welfare side of things. Um, being the national program manager for horse protection. Um, I did that for eight years. So I've had a, a quite a long stem so far in the regulatory government area since 2004, I guess you'd say. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it. So um, sounds like you've <laughs> done a number of things. How did you get involved in uh, public practice? Well, actually, um, I got the opportunity to work in public practice as a student assistant while I was in veterinary school. Um, unfortunately, there was an outbreak of bovine tuberculosis in Michigan when I was in vet school there. And at that time, they needed students to help out during the summer. Um, so I actually got the opportunity to work at the Michigan Department of Agriculture um, during my second year of vet school or that summer time frame. And I actually got to work with um, the rabies surveillance for dogs and raccoons and also with Eastern equine encephalitis for horses. Um, so, and as well as for rabies for horses. So I got to work with the veterinarians on all different types of disease surveillance programs, um, which was really exciting because um, I was one of the first to find out that we'd have rabies in our state and any type of outbreak. So I thought it was it was really intriguing and I really enjoyed it, um, learning more and more about public practice. Um, so I really got my start early on um, in vet school. So it sounds like those those kinds of experiences are, are really important. Um, how many students would you say kind of, at least um, I know you were at Michigan State, kind of participated in those kinds of experiences? And was that like a clinical rotation? Tell us a little bit kind of um, no, well, my time of being able to work as a student assistant for the Department of Agriculture, there wasn't, there was just a very few amount of us, um, maybe three or four per class um, that got the opportunity to do that. And there was one clinical rotation, um, public practice rotation that we got to shadow around and see other aspects of um, regulatory medicine and so forth. But there wasn't that many that was really um, interested in it or knew about it. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the 
kind of the hidden secrets is public practice and that there is so much opportunity um, to advance your career in veterinary medicine in these aspects. Um, now, if you'd see, I work with, there's probably about, um, I think maybe close to 3,000 or so um, veterinarians that work in public practice now. 3,000. Um, so that's more than I thought. So um, why don't you give us a, I guess, a, one of the things I guess maybe I should have asked is how is public practice defined? Like what's, what's a definition for public practice? Well, um, I guess you'd say public practice is more like Basically, we are are trying to help out in general the public as well as the animals. And basically what we do in USDA, we ensure that the animals are healthy from farm to fork. I guess you do sometimes people say because we make sure that once those animals get on the farm that they're going to be disease free and then once they get all the way to the grocery store or to that Outback Steakhouse or whatever, um, that they're going to be something that is disease free. You don't have to worry about it. And it's interesting. You never think that veterinarians are that engaged to that component, but we are all the way to to where they're going to be um, where you would eat them. Um, or in nature also, we worry about the animals that the public sees. Like, like I said, I used to work in this area called animal care. And so that was a component that basically any animal that you see on the TV or the zoos or, or SeaWorld or wherever, we ensure that those animals are being taken care of appropriately. Um, because any animal that's in the public view, we would ensure that that's being done. Okay. All right. So um, thanks, Rachel. So Dr. Valerie Reagan has now joined I'm not hearing us. You, if you can hear me. So bear with me just a minute. We can hear you. Can you hear us? All right. Sounds like she's still having a few uh, a few issues. So, um, within USDA, there seems to be a lot of different kinds of of things that folks can do. So it's kind of a little bit drilling down more on your current job. So you know, or at least public practice in general. So for folks that may not know, maybe pre vets who be um, maybe watching, um, is this a nine to five job? Anyway. Oh. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I would say for some or majority, yes, it can be, um, depending on where you at, where, what you're doing um, within the arena of public practice. Um, of course, you know, we actually endured um, avian influenza, bird flu last year. Um, and so there was a lot of our veterinary staff that was deployed out to help with those surveillances and the, and trying to um, make sure that outbreak was being uh, being negated as much as possible. So so there was a lot of individuals that did have to work a lot more than just nine to five um, during that time frame, um, and that's because we're kind of like the ones that are the, the frontline soldiers um, when there's an emergency for any type of animal emergency that goes out. So. So we're, we're, we try to be available as much as we can, um, but most of the time it is 40 hours. And, and also too, what's nice is that um, there is some, some positions as well that is really starting to utilize more telecommuting. So then you can work out of your home or, um, and also there's also, you have to travel, you can travel a fair amount too. It depends on the position that you go into. Dr. Reagan is now with us. Hi. Hi. Wouldn't you know, our, our whole university internet went down at 10 hours. <laughs> it's back now. Murphy's Law, right? <laughs> That's true. So, well, welcome to the show. We've just been chatting a little bit about um, what Rachel does at uh, USDA and um, a little bit about her thoughts on, um, on how she got into public practice. So um, our, our custom on the show is to allow our guests to do a little bit of introduction um, 
um, themselves. So uh, why don't you just jump on in, tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you came to work in and around kind of issues around public practice. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. And hi, Rachel. Nice to see you again. Um, one of the nice things about this public practice community is it's a relatively small community, which is nice because we all pretty much know each other. So that's that's a nice thing. Um, but I kind of came came to it in a, in a kind of a roundabout way. Um, I went to veterinary school thinking I would be a private practitioner um, because that's pretty much all I really knew that veterinarians did, quite honestly. Um, so I practiced about five and a half years in a small animal practice where towards the end of it was kind of expanding into uh, whatever would fit in the door, mainly for my own little stimulation of doing some different things. Um, after about three years, I found myself um, kind of searching around a little bit for something different, and I didn't know what that was going to be. But what I knew, what I realized was that um, I didn't want to be in that same building for the rest of my life. I still love veterinary medicine. I loved animals. I actually loved our clients. I had a great, great clientele. Um, but I had grown up overseas, and I had grown up traveling around and interacting with um, a lot of different types of people and different environments. And I recognized that going into that same building before the sun came up and being there until after the sun went down was not something I really wanted to do for the rest of my life. But I didn't have any clue what else to do. So I thought about maybe starting my own practice. Um, and then I, because I was working for somebody, and then I, the more I thought about that, I thought, well, I'll probably just be in a different building from before the sun, sun comes up to when the sun goes down. So I ended up actually seeing a brochure um, one night when I was awake late waiting for a dog to come in that had been hit by a car. I saw a brochure on public veterinary practice careers. It was a USDA uh, APHIS veterinary services brochure. And I opened it up and saw pictures of people, veterinarians in the field, um, veterinarians on airplanes and just out and about. And it just intrigued me. I didn't really know what public practice was, but long story short, I applied for the training program, not really having any idea what I was getting into. And uh, I just knew it was different and, and I had an opportunity to get outside. And so during that training, um, I was exposed to the whole breadth of, of veterinary the whole breadth of public practice at USDA, which includes both um, the veterinary services branch where I was working for includes everything from animal welfare things, some of the similar things that what Rachel's doing, um, to uh, we had a, a whole lot of training on domestic diseases like brucellosis and tuberculosis, but also on foreign animal diseases and included things such as personnel management, um, and a lot of other areas, the breadth of areas, skills that I, I hadn't really thought about that I would ever do. So when I finished that, I ended up working um, for APHIS Veterinary Services in South Florida. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, I trained in Tennessee during the training program. And at the end of it, we were asked if we wanted to, you know, what kind of work we thought we would want to do and what part of the country we thought we would want to live in. And then they would do our, their best to match us up as, you know, with whatever positions are available. So I requested to be in a very, very busy field position somewhere, preferably in the southeast, because that's where I was more, more used to. So I ended up as a um, being assigned to South Florida as a field veterinarian, and I worked out of my house uh, initially with a government car, and I worked on primarily brucellosis on large cattle ranches, which is about as far from what I was doing as you can possibly go. Um, but I was trained on the job very well, and I had a, a really, really fantastic mentor, um, which is a really a key, I think, to, to moving forward in any profession, actually, who helped me through the tough parts and answered a lot of my questions. And while I was there, I also received additional training uh, by USDA uh, in epidemiology. And so I evolved into working as a field veterinarian first and then as a as a, uh, a the area epidemiology officer for the state of Florida, which means I got to deal with you know whatever uh, 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 diseases on a much broader scale than, than just brucellosis, which I loved. Um, and then I was I moved back to Tennessee in the same position, and then from there was moved to the D.C. area as the senior staff brucellosis uh, for for senior senior staff veterinarian or national brucellosis epidemiologist. So I dealt with it at a national scale. Um, the whole program management, which I thoroughly loved. 
during that time, the opportunities arose for me to be able to do some international travel as well and, and working with other countries on their brucellosis programs, which fulfilled that personal need of mine to be able to travel and to, to go to different places and to have new challenges every day um, that were actually very challenging for me because I hadn't really been raised in that environment. <laughs> um, so I did that for a while and then I got promoted up to the assistant deputy administrator position for vet services, uh, which is even a, 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 a broader scale, um, asked to set up a national surveillance unit uh, for um, for USDA to, to deal with animal health surveillance at a national scale um, and, and dealt with a number of very large programs at the upper level of the program management, which I enjoyed for a while, but I kind of missed the feel part. I kind of missed that uh, hands-on dealing with the, the actual uh, brucellosis um, complex issues that I really enjoyed. So I ended up leaving there and starting my own business, doing primarily international uh, brucellosis work along with some other some other works. I had a business partner who was more on the political side, so we had that mix of policy and um, technical. Um, and so I got to go back overseas and do a lot of work in the international arena that I really enjoyed, setting up programs and dealing with um, pro, uh, problem complex cases, um, both uh, privately and working for governments as well. And I did some work for World Bank, doing some country level assessments in the Republic of Georgia and some other things that really satisfied my own personal needs. And then I think one of the things that's really important in moving into a public practice arena is, is again, a good mentor, but also the networking that we get by getting to know each other and being involved in a lot of different areas. So one of my network connections was the dean uh, who, 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 was at, who was the dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine here. Um, who developed the, the brucellosis vaccine that we were using worldwide. So I had known him for a long time because of that vaccination connection. And um, he essentially um, connected with me and talked about taking over this Center for Public and Corporate Veterinary Medicine here at Virginia Tech. Um, actually, we have a Virginia, Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. We have a campus in Maryland and a campus here and actually an equine center also in Leesburg. So, um, he recruited me to come in and basically take the center and reinvigorate it and grow it and help train veterinarians for the public practice positions of the future. Um, it was kind of a really wide open job description, which fits me perfectly. So um, I essentially sold my interest in the company and um, came here. And I actually started at the Maryland campus about seven years ago uh, there because of the DC connection so that we could work very hard with the federal agencies and others in the area to to basically revamp uh, the whole public corporate track and, and practice area. Um, so I worked there for about five years and then I transferred down here to Blacksburg, Virginia to the main campus and essentially doing the same thing and training. Do two, two primary things. One is training veterinary students to do this kind of work, which I love teaching. So it was a good personal fit. Um, the other thing is that we do a lot of work with career transition. Uh, veterinarians, which is veterinarians who want to move from a private, generally private practice, not always, and so, sometimes they move around within industry or other areas, um, but also um, who want to change the system. And, and Rachel and I have worked together on some of this, helping veterinarians change from one area of veterinary medicine to another. So our area of public practice includes, and I'm sorry, I didn't hear what Rachel said earlier because I had technical issues, but it includes not only government agencies, federal government and state agencies, but it also in, in, includes the corporate and industry side. Um, so there's a large public, uh, uh, corporate and industry side of public practice as well. So that's that's kind of my my long convoluted way to get here. None of which was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great! It's great. So um, there seems to be all kinds of positions available. And when you add um, industry and kind of corporate positions to the mix, it seems um, that, you know, if there's something interesting that you want to do, you certainly should be able to find it. Yes? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so one of the things, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Valerie. One, one of the things that we do, and, and that's one of the beauties of public practice, but also one of the challenges is because when people want to make career changes, sometimes they don't know what they want to go do. They just know they want to do something different. 
So one of the things that we start with with our own students here that are interested in this breadth of veterinary medicine, but also our career transition veterinarians, is we start by having them walk through some self-assessments. And you know, what is it that you like to do and what is it that you don't like to do? We don't usually start with what job do you want because they don't generally know what jobs are out there. Um, so for me, I recognized later, I wish I'd recognized it earlier, that I needed some free. Uh, I needed some real challenges, things that I didn't didn't really know how to do. I kind of like tackling those. And different people have different things that they're looking for. And so we try and tease out what is it that you're actually looking for that you like to do and that you don't like to do to help figure out which of these many different areas uh, are you interested in. Okay. Yeah, Great. and actually I can add to that as well that um, here at least in USDA, we have a lot of different um, student, student opportunities like scholarship opportunities. Um, specifically, there's one called the Salty Wilson Scholarship Program that is a really wonderful opportunity for pre-veterinary students and veterinary students. Um, and they can basically, if they are accepted to this scholarship program, they get to come to the USDA and get to work with veterinarians during their summer break, um, during their winter break or Thanksgiving break as well. And they get to find out all the different areas that we work in. And then at the end of their term, of their veterinary school term, um, they have an opportunity to work a full time and a permanent position in USDA. So it's a really wonderful opportunity, um, that scholarship program. Yeah, that sounds that like is, a really great. Yeah, that is really a great program. And some of our students are on that scholarship. It's a, it's a great opportunity for them. They love it. Um, they love the opportunity to explore during their holidays to, to, to work and learn about that. Um, the, the USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service also just recently started a similar, actually this year, I think, started a similar scholarship program as well. So those, there are those opportunities for, for students to explore some of this area. Great. So um, let's talk a little bit about diversity and kind of racial and ethnic diversity. So I've been hanging around <laughs> the profession for a pretty long time. And um, it seems, and maybe it's just the circles that I um, roll around in, but it does seem that those individuals, um, that those practice areas that would um, constitute public practice seem a bit more racially and ethnically diverse than um, potentially what I would typically see in um, kind of what we would consider a more clinical, traditional, um, small animal or even large animal practice. Um, is there any data on that? Is it an anomaly that I'm just kind of seeing? <laughs> I don't know if there's actual data and I'll, maybe Rachel has some from her perspective there within USDA, but I can tell you from here, being at the vet school now for seven years, um, I can tell you that there's been a real effort to, um, to reach out and, and bring in a more diverse student body. Um, and, and I haven't been here very long, if you talk about the length of, 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 a, of an academic career, which I, seems weird for me to even be here, which says that with this degree you can work anywhere because that's the last place I thought I would work in. But in the last few years, I've, I've seen a, a, just in my own uh, observations here is a real change in, at least at our college, in the, the, the racial and cultural makeup of our students. And it's, it's a real, it's been an honest, um, active effort on our part of the part of our university. And I think the more students that we bring in that have diverse backgrounds, and by diversity, I mean racially, racially, culturally, but also um, life, life experience diversity, which is very, very valuable. And you put all those students together and it's a very rich environment. And I think the more that we get students like that, the more they bring in more from their own background. And, and, and it's really, a, it's been a real positive thing, I think. And it's opened up a lot of opportunities um, for students um, who maybe were intimidated um, and what I'm thinking a little bit more of that is generally the little bit older student um, who has another career who may be thinking maybe I really can't do this or go back in with all these younger students or whatever, but they fit in very well. And I think it's an, a diverse environment encourages that. Rachel, yeah. anything to add? Yeah, and I can add actually that one of our things in the USDA or in general in the federal government, um, we have a really big initiative to recruit um, towards diversity. And so you'll see that 
if you go to different conferences, we're there trying to recruit the finest and the most, you know, diverse group of individuals. We are always at the Mi uh, Manners, Minorities, Agricultural, Natural Resources and Related Sciences Conference every year. Um, we actually do a big sponsorship for them as well. And then also to a lot of, we have a fair amount of um, other scholarships that are available specifically for 1890, sorry, <laughs> for 1890 um, schools, um, which are historical black college universities. And so there in that component, you know, we help with trying to diversify our workforce as well. So we do a really big um, push towards trying to diversify um, as much as possible here because the the public, the ones that we are actually working for is a diverse group that we need to also be culturally aware of as well. Sure. Um, some of the meetings that I ap attend during the course of, of the year, like SACNIS, which is coming up in a few weeks in the Society for Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, um, usually has a really, really strong um, um, representation um, across agencies, um, not just USDA, but NIH and CDC and FDA and, and all of these agencies that are um, recruiting. So certainly it sounds like um, for, for both of you, your careers have been kind of more focused along the lines of um, agriculture. Um, could you, um, either of you, um, speak to some of the other opportunities at other agencies maybe? Go ahead, Valerie. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, yeah, we, Rachel and I tend to, to lean a little bit more towards our discussions on USDA because that's where our backgrounds primarily are. Um, but we work a lot here at our university with a breadth of agencies, and those include, of course, there's Food and Drug Administration, um, which hires a lot of veterinarians and also has some good training opportunities um, and some, some positions. The Food Safety Inspection Service that I mentioned before. Um, has a, has a, a breadth of, of positions available, not only in plant, slaughter plant positions, which is what I thought was all they did many years ago, but they do a lot of, of um, you know, outbreak investigations, uh, risk analysis type work, residue type work, a lot of other things, but also CDC hires veterinarians. So we have a number of students that are there on um, different kinds of programs. There's a Hubert Global Fellowship program that some of our students have gone through the epi Epidemic in Intelligence Service um, that uh, DVM MPH is students. We have a couple of those in there. Um, and there are other like Department of Homeland Security has veterinarians working in there. The FBI has at least one that I know of. Um, so yes, there's a, a breadth of things. Of course, the Public Health Service, the U.S. Public Health Service, has veterinarians that work across federal agencies in public health. Um, and then we can't forget the state side as well. The state public health veterinarians or state veterinarians, which are more of the agriculture side. Um, but there, there is quite a, a range of opportunities for veterinarians in a number of different agencies. And I'm, you know, there, there are a number, those are the primary ones that I'm talking about that hire the, the, the most veterinarians, but there are some veterinarians here and there um, they're a little harder for us to capture because they're not all necessarily in a veterinary named title. Um, they may be in administration, um, management, some different levels that they they actually apply the skills we know at, we we learn as veterinarians in those roles, but they may not necessarily be classed as classified as a veterinarian. So it's a little harder to capture that data. Right, and actually, what I was going to add was that um, I actually was in the Air National Guard for about six years as a public health officer. Um, and I didn't know that they actually would hire veterinarians um, as a public health officer, but I had found out that one of my supervisors in the USDA was um, in the Air Force and that nature. And so I always thought that you had to be active duty in order to go to the Army or the Air Force or any type of military, but there is still this guards and reserve that gives opportunities for veterinarians to explore even more within their career. Wow, this is a pretty broad set of opportunities. And I know certainly um, our CEO, um, Dr. Andy McCabe, um, his, uh, he's still active duty um, in Air Force Reserves, but uh, his uh, job before coming here, um, he was with CDC as the liaison between CDC and FDA. So, <clears throat> so there's certainly um, a, a wide range of, of opportunities there. So, 
Let's talk a little bit about um, how does a pre-vet student, how would a pre-vet student really kind of learn about these kind of career opportunities, shy of listening to this wonderful podcast, of course, um, shameless plug, but um, what kinds of opportunities might exist um, for this kind of exposure for a pre-vet student so that we can kind of have an opportunity to, to think about what that pipeline looks like? Okay, I was, I don't know if you want to go first, but Rachel had already mentioned the Salty Wilson Scholarship, which is a, a fantastic way for them to gain some exposure um, to public practice in that arena. Um, a pre-vet student, what, what I would suggest pre-vet students do is the same thing that I would suggest we do with veterinarians and veterinary students, and that's to first reflect a little bit on what kinds of things do you like to do as opposed to what kind of job is out there. So um, even if you, and they've actually had our own students just string together keywords and then Google it and see what's up there. For example, public health, um, you know, animal welfare. Um, there's a whole lot of what types of things, international, um, you know, international vet medicine is a big part of public practice as well. So just string together a few words and just see what kind of positions are out there. Um, what kind of work is out there uh, just to start to get an idea of the, the type of arena perhaps that you want to work in because it is so broad it's hard to it's hard to just say some particular things but there are certain programs um, besides Salty Wilson um, the public health service has a junior uh, what they call junior co-step I forget what it is uh, um, a junior officer it's a training program for for undergraduates to, to actually get into the public health program. Um, <clears throat> different associations, and one of the things that we forgot to mention also that veterinarians work in is, is um, associations, or for example, the American Veterinary Medical Association. And a lot of the associations have, uh, a lot of the different focus areas have associations for American Association of Zoo Veterinarians, for example, American Association of industry veterinarians, for example. There are a lot of those associations of those types of work, and a number of those organizations have student opportunities um, as well. So if you go to AAZV, for example, um, and look at student opportunities, and I'm doing this without doing it right now, so I assume they have one. Most of them do have uh, student training opportunities um, or student exposure opportunities. Um, and then there's the, I, I, Rachel, I'll, I won't, step into your area, but the Pathways, USDA's Pathways program, I'll, I'll be quiet and let her add to what I've okay. said. <laughs> well, actually, I was going to add about, um, we have a high school program um, for kids, um, I think grades 7 through 12, and it's called the Ag Discovery Summer Program, and actually it's about, we partner with about 20 or so colleges around the country, and we have about 15 to 20 high school students that'll go to these summer camps around the country and they'll focus either on a different area in the USDA, either if it's be veterinary medicine or, or food farming, crops or um, legislative programs, um, communications, just different areas. But um, there's a fair amount of them that focus specifically on veterinary medicine and especially in the regulatory realm of them. Um, and every high school, I used to help with um, coordinating one that is in Florida um, AMU University and that one was more animal welfare, zoo, veterinary related and every high school student that would go through it, they were just always like, I'm going to be a vet after this. I'm going to be, this is totally what I want to be. So it's really great opportunity to let the especially high school students to start being wary of, of what's out there and what's available for them um, so they can keep on that track of becoming a veterinarian but also like um, Valerie just said we do have the pathways students program and where we just like with the salty wilson but with the, the pathways program we do take in summer student interns and they can work here for for not just here in the riverdale area but anywhere in the country if there's an opportunity available to take in a summer student intern. And then that gives them an opportunity, like I said, to come back every summer and to hopefully fulfill a full-time permanent position afterward as well. Okay. 
So um, with the government, are the positions, I'm assuming the positions particularly given, um, well, depending on the d position, I suppose, um, are they all over the country? Are they localized in specific places? Certainly we know that the CDC is in Atlanta, but certainly they have different offices. A lot of um, USDA's headquarters are here in the DC metro area. Um, very kind of East Coast heavy, but can people find positions all over the country? Um, I can help with that first. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, there is a lot of different positions that's available all over the country and specifically the ones that are not in, like we have sort of like hubs right now, like there's in Colorado in North Carolina um, and here in the DC area, but um, also too in a different our different ports, our different um, airports. Um, we have different quarantine facilities, especially with what I deal with now. Um, like I know a fair amount of veterinarians work in the Miami area, some work in LA and um, in New York. And as well as some of them that actually just work out in the field, they work out of their home and then they go to different facilities and, and check in those areas. Um, but also a really big thing that I have just been wary of is um, how much of international we are um, able to do work. Um, recently, I have a colleague that just became a foreign agricultural officer um, and she just did her first training stint in China. And now she's gonna be um, located in Mexico City for the next year. So there's just, and, and what's awesome is that she's considered a diplomat um, for, for the US now. And, um, and, it's, and it's great, you know, she's getting this opportunity as a veterinarian. And I had no idea that we had these, but now, you know, now that I know, I think I'm really excited to let others know that, you know, there's so many opportunities out there, not just within our USA, but international too. So those folks would be in the embassy then, have maintain offices in the embassy? Mm-hmm, yep. That's really cool. Wow. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That's really cool. So, um, so what would you tell, um, I guess, a new graduate? Like, because one of the criticisms certainly that I've heard over the years um, is, um, yes, yes, we tell veterinary students um, that there are lots of opportunities in public practice and with the government and corporate and industry. Um, and then when individuals go to apply, there's usually some type of, this is the criticism, so I have never actually seen this, but um, that there is um, a requirement that they have been in practice for a number of years or something like that. Now, certainly we'll see um, students that may have come through certain types of programs and, and immediately um, began work. But what kinds of positions might be a good fit for um, a student looking at graduation in the next year or so um, and um, really doesn't want to go do something else first? Yeah, I guess I'll start off with that since I deal with that every day. <laughs> um, because I, I direct the public and corporate track here, so it's veterinary students that are specifically focused on public practice positions. So a part of what we do is, uh, you know, as I've already said a couple of times, is helping them figure out where their areas of interest are and during their time here, helping to create the networks and to explore these potential areas so that um, when they're about to graduate, they both have a good understanding of the type of position that's out there. And hopefully they've spent some of their fourth year getting those opportunities. So they're not just shooting for the hip, uh, from the hip, just applying to positions out there all over the place. So there are some positions, yes, that require um, some public, uh, some pra private practice um, uh, experience, uh, largely on the industry co um, corporate side, there are more of those positions that require private practice. But we work with our students and some of them want to do some private practice first and others absolutely do not. So with the ones that absolutely do not, um, I, I don't want them working on my dog when they graduate. So we work with them to try and you know assess their interest and potential fits for them. And there are plenty of them. A lot of our students uh, go right into public practice without without private practice. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's more of finding the right fit um, but by doing the proper assessing and, and learning about what's out there. But the other part of that is, and this is probably a little aside to what we're talking about, is, is writing a resume in a way that 
um, is appealing to somebody who's looking to hire a brand new graduate. So what I mean by that is that a lot of times a, a brand new graduate, or I shouldn't just say that, not even just brand new graduates, a lot of veterinarians that are wanting to change careers is, all, is also write their resume in a way that's very focused on me. You know, I want this, I want that, I want you to train me for this, I want you to train me for that. A resume should, really should be written in a way that's focused on the job that they're looking for and highlights the key things, the skills and background abilities that you have that make you the perfect person for that job. So really what the resume should say, it should scream, you want, you need me, not I want to work for you. And so a lot of times the mistake, I think, is they say, well, I don't get hired. I'm not getting hired here, here, here. No, you know, nobody wants me because I don't have any experience. Well, when you look at the resume and the application, it's like, you know, well, no wonder you're not getting hired. It's all about me or, or even, you know, I've never done this before, but I would like to. Well, t just taking the time to do a professional uh, resume that's very focused on the position and, and then during that time before you apply for that position, building, recognizing what the skills are that are important in that position and making sure you get those skills. So um, it is a process. And yes, there are some positions that require or prefer a little bit of practice experience. And if we have students that are any in any way, shape or form interested in doing some practice, I encourage them to go ahead and do it um, because they should do it if they're inclined to um, for their own feeling that they're doing what they want to do and they may find they're happy there. And if they are, I've still done my job as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I think that, you know, th there is a tremendous amount of, of opportunity out there in the public practice arena for, for students that, that don't want to practice first. It's just a matter of doing a good job of doing your homework and finding out what is it that you want to do and what skills or background do you have to, including your fourth year rotations that are going to make you a desirable candidate. Great advice, um, particularly on the um, the the uh, resume. Great advice. Um, so one thing that I know, um, and I, it's probably been twenty some years that, since I applied for a federal job, um, is that process as laborious as it used to be? <laughs> Rachel, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> pitch that one to you. <laughs> I could, I could tell you that, um, you know, we have the USA Jobs website now, which helps you in developing your resume on there. However, it is important, just like Valerie said, you need to make sure that your resume is going to reflect the duties that you're going to get of the job that you're applying for. Um, because a lot of times, what's happening is that there's somebody in HR that's just basically trying to point out the different words that you have in your resume to see if if you qualify in that that matter and that's it and then you move on to the next step of an interview um, a phone interview a face-to-face -face interview or so forth but um, usually now um, we're given now really limited time frames to turn around positions. Um, like for instance, I have one position now um, that I have to get interviewed for um, and I have to be hire that person within a month. Um, it used to be 90 days it would, and you could extend it and extend it. And, but now they don't want those extensions anymore. They want us to hire them um, within a month. Um, the unfortunate thing that I think that's been happening recently because we have been getting a lot of applications is there's been this limit on how many individuals that can apply and the positions are only open for a week. So that's why I always advise anyone that's applying for federal jobs to make sure on that USA Jobs website, you have your email alerts for any position daily because those positions are may only be open for a week. And also they only are allowing thir the first 30 to apply. So it's just it's just really limited now because they're really trying to push to get it done because um, that's been a big thing this past administration especially. 
Wow, that's um, that's a pretty tight time frame. So um, definitely also good advice to make sure that you're on USA Jobs, you said? Yeah, usajobs.gov. Okay. And uh, and apparently they have alerts. So um, what kind of um, advice would you give to the transitioner, the person who's been out in practice? Let's let's just make up a candidates. Right. So this person has been out in practice for 20 years. Um, they actually do see an ending to paying off their student loans. <laughs> <laughs> there is a horizon that they actually can see, um, but they are interested in, in maybe coming out of the clinic and doing something different. So where would that person begin? Besides, you know, besides the Google, where would that person start? My advice, and we, and we get a lot of those that we work with, and my advice would be to start with uh, determining what is what is it that you're looking for and I don't mean job wise if you're running to leave a, a private practice that's what your example is right leaving private practice right if you want to leave private practice what are the drivers for making you want to make that change and if you don't really take a good hard look at that first um, a lot of people end up job jumping because they you know I've, I've actually had veterinarians I've worked with who are in their third or fourth clinic and it's always somebody's you know either the they didn't like something about this place or they didn't like something about that place or the person they work for when we really dig into the discussion it's just that they want to make a change from private practice so i find if you don't do that self-assessment of what is it i'm looking for um personally and career-wise then it's, it's sometimes it's going to be hard to find a job that's really satisfying so you know do you want to work with the public or not um, do you, you know, are you willing to go back to school and get maybe a PhD or master's or not? Um, what does your ideal career look like? Is it a nine to five or is it one there you don't care what hours you work as long as you get to work outside? Um, or, you know, those kinds of things, both personally wise and career wise. And I always say, describe to me your ideal career. Just don't worry about what job, but what would your ideal career be that would really make you happy? Some people say, you know, hands on with animals. Some people say, I never want to touch an animal again as long as I live. Um, some people say, I've got to have that personal interaction. Other people say, put me in a lab. I'm tired of seeing people. That I want to leave practice because I'm tired of working with the public. So all of those pieces need to be sorted out first. And then once you have an idea of the kinds of things that you're looking for and the reason why you want to make a change, then you can start looking for career areas that would fit those personal needs and make you really happy. So what happens is people do it the other way. They start looking for jobs first and without doing that assessment piece. So if you're looking for a, a, a job where you're, that, where you're tired of public interaction and you want to be someplace where you can just think and work by yourself and, and you, know, you apply for a job that's got you dealing with the public all day long, you're not going to be very happy. And vice versa, if you're really a people person, and you apply for the director of a, labor, of a laboratory job or a, a lab, a veterinary diagnostic lab, you're probably not going to be happy in that environment. So I would always say start with that. And, and then once you really kind of figured out what is it um, that you're looking for, then start looking for what kind of opportunities are there that fit those criteria. So one of the questions I always ask people is, are you running to something or are you running from something? So if you're running towards something, you probably have an idea of what it is that would be really make you happy. If you're just running away from something, a bad work environment or whatever, and you take the first job that comes along without doing that assessment piece, you're probably not going to be very happy very long. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the way I would suggest starting is doing some real reflection on personal reflection and career reflection and use that to guide your job search. Wow. Um, also good advice for uh, just about anybody. We all have to um, excerpt that and <laughs> make sure that it gets circulated pretty widely. Yeah. The other thing, um, I, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is a, a something that I always share with both our students and our, our changing career veterinarians, and that is to start taking a look at what's actually happening out there that you find interesting. So one of the things I do is I usually route people who are interested in public practice to the U.S. Animal Health Association website which is usaha.org and I tell them to click on committees and just see topics of what types of things public practice veterinarians are working on 
And if you go to committees and look at that and find a topic that you find interesting, then go look at the committee uh, reports and see what kinds, what are the hot topics in that area. And you can also click on committee members and see who's on that committee, but more importantly, where do they work? Because that gives you an idea of a, the breadth of areas that you can work in besides just the, the ones we typically think of, which is government or, you know, certain companies. It gives you a breadth of ideas of, of potential workplaces that maybe people hadn't even thought of before. Um, and so, and, and, and the other thing is, you know, that we're very focused on government, but we also need to think inside as well. So, you know, I'd suggest they go talk to their state veterinarian or talk to their state public health veterinarian, see what their day's like, what do you deal with? You know, does that trip your trigger or not? Um, that, whole, that whole assessment piece is a really, really important starting point. Yeah, actually, I could add to that as well, is that one big component, which Valerie did touch on, is just network network with individuals that are in that those areas that you may be interested in or you may not be interested in it i mean just you need to really find out for sure if that's the area you want to be in I, and don't be afraid to ask anyone to shadow them for a day um, i recently did have a veterinarian that was transitioning out of another type of um, career um, she was more like a like a contracting veterinary specialist for booz allen hamilton um, but she wanted to do something different and work in the federal government, something that could be more sustainable. So she actually came and shadowed me for a day and we talked about, you know, how she need to have her resume completed and so forth. And now um, she's working with FDA. Um, so I think the thing is that you just really need to not be afraid to ask individuals, can I come hang out with you for a day and see what you do? Um, because you know, most of us are all, gonna, all nice veterinarians and we don't mind, you know, people coming to see what we do, even though there can be rough days. Um, most of the time we're, we're pretty open to having others shadow us. And good Great. days. And good days. Both sides. <laughs> yes. Good, just like everybody's job, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> I have um, just two last questions. Um, and um, do you see this area, this kind of um, public practice, which is kind of a, an amalgam of a lot of different kinds of, of positions and things to do, do you see this area growing in terms mm -hmm. of jobs and opportunities for veterinary medicine? Yeah, I absolutely do. And it's not just me. I was fiddling with my other laptop trying to bring up something here that, that I thought would be helpful to that. Um, and there was a U.S. government, uh, government accountability office GAO report that came out in 2015. And there's a quote from it. There's a couple of quotes in it. But starting to talk about the, the rate of veterinarian, uh, the vacancy rate for veterinarians that's coming up. And they're pretty dramatic um, because of, of potential requirements. Like, for example, it says uh, for FSIS veterinarians, food safety inspection, uh, for 43% um, of them are eligible to retire by fiscal year 2018. Um, in veterinary services where I worked, 45% uh, of the veterinarians will be eligible to retire by fiscal year 2016, so now. There are also a lot of other reports that talk about real kind of scary shortages in both academia and in the industry side. So there are certain areas where they're not going to be, you know, quite probably quite as many, but there's certain real significant um, areas that are, are growing. And I know from a lot of people that I talk to, friends of mine who work in diagnostic labs, that uh, veterinary diagnostic lab managers, directors of veterinary diagnostic labs across the country are having real shortages. They just aren't really aware of those kinds of positions necessarily. So, yeah, there are some pretty, pretty dramatic um, needs. Rachel, maybe from your perspective. Oh, yeah, definitely. I was going to mention that we're definitely in the retirement stage of a lot of individuals. And I swear, probably just within this year, with maybe five or six veterinarians I know that has retired just within this area, um, and which is amazing um, because we're really starting to focus on succession planning, um, how to get others more engaged with leadership um, because it's really important um, because there's a lot of, it's that time that a lot of individuals are, are able to retire and they're taking the opportunity and they're going. <laughs> so it's one thing that with, 
you know, it, it cycles just like everything else does sure. because there are predictions uh, back in 20, 2007, 2008, there, there'd be huge dramatic, uh, you know, opportunities. But at that time was when the, the economy tanked. So a lot of people who were eligible to retire did not. And now they're going out in droves. And so I think mm -hmm. a real telling thing to that was Rachel's discussion on how fast they're filling positions and how they're limiting them. The recognition, I think, just the, the way that they're filling positions tells you what the needs yeah. are, in my mind. Mm -hmm. Certainly, certainly. It sounds also sounds a bit like this this area of the profession is um, seems to really be in a in a period of being very, I guess, gray, graying, as we say, the graying sector of the profession, um, which is certainly something that we see in, in all areas. And certainly um, at AVMC, we're starting to look at that among our faculty. But it does um, sound like maybe there are some um, unique and more kind of pressing um, issues around retirements and, and kind of a lot of, of folks leaving um, public practice. Right, and just to add to that a little bit too, the the, the sh there are a lot of shifts in uh, things that veterinarians are working in, and so there are a lot of areas now that we weren't really that engaged in before that we're becoming more engaged in. For the, for example, the whole One Health arena, um, the the intersection of human and animal health and environmental health, especially with climate change, is opening up opportunities in new areas. And I would add a fourth circle to that, and that's social economic health. Because if we're really looking at solving problems, we need to be looking at um, broader than the silos that we've originally all kind of worked in. And so now we're dealing with new areas and new things that we, we haven't really dealt with to, to much degree before. For example, we have veterinarians working on health effects of the Fukushima disaster, the nuclear disaster. Mm -hmm. We have veterinarians working on um, the, the impacts, the potential impacts both to aquatic life and um, animals grazing in the area after the Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster. And so there, there are a lot of areas that now with the, the, the skills that we have, the breadth of skills that we have um, beyond just the, the technical clinical skills are starting to be recognized more. And there's a lot more press um, about both from AABMC's reports and other reports about the needs of, of the ro potential roles for veterinarians in society. And so that's why there's a lot more demand for us worldwide is because we've become such more of a more of a global society now that uh, there's a lot of demand for veterinarians working in, in other areas internationally to, to deal with issues that we didn't really spend much time on before because we were very mm -hmm. on our own country and issues. And now, as, as Rachel expanded, uh, mentioned earlier, there are a lot of areas that are expanding uh, internationally, too, because things are different than they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Sure. Wow. So uh, last question before we wrap up, um, our hour is almost up, and that is what advice would you give? You've given a lot of, of great, um, great advice today. What parting advice would you give to a pre-vet, a vet student, and that career person who is thinking about um, about a career in public practice? Certainly we know that um, they need to do those self-assessments, but uh, what parting parting shot would you give them? I guess my thing would be um, is to not be afraid to take that leap of faith and try public practice and and like I said, and network and shadow individuals to see what it's about because you just you never realize the the venue that veterinarians can be involved in um, in the public practice arena. So it's you just really got to go out there and see what it's about. Yeah, I guess I would I would totally agree with Rachel. Um, and I would add to that a couple of things. And one is that just the thought that if you're bored with this degree, it's your own fault because there's such an incredible amount of things out there that you can do. Um, and in addition to what she was mentioning about the networking and exploring, which is really, really important, uh, I would I would also uh, say it would be a really great idea to um, get yourself a mentor. Find somebody who's working in an area you're really interested in and and uh, see if they can, you know, as, as Rachel was saying, either, you know, start shadowing them, you know, just to kind of get a feel for what they do. But if you can find somebody to help support your, your, your path, um, I think that's a really good idea. Great, you heard it here. If you're bored with your veterinary degree, it's your fault. 
<laughs> That's the best line so far this season. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Thank you both, Valerie and Rachel, for joining us um, on uh, diversity and inclusion on air. This has been a really great episode, um, really informative. So thank you both. Thanks no for the problem. Good to see you. Good to see you, Rachel. Good to see you too, Valerie. All right. So I'd also like to shout out and thank our um, student producer, William Willis, is in the background, uh, making sure that we all um, are seen and heard. So thank you. Um, you don't see him, but he's there. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the work that he and um, Arturo uh, Munoz does as well. So um, thank you for joining another episode of AAVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air. If you'd like to learn more about diversity, get programming ideas, and see some of the things that we're working on in, at the AAVMC office related to diversity, be sure to like the podcast Facebook page, um, uh, Diversity and Inclusion on Air. Um, this is also a great place to suggest topics for the show, um, as well as exchange programming ideas um, for or things that you can do locally on your campus, in your practice, or um, anywhere. So um, again, thank you to both of my guests, and we will see uh, you all next time. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Take care. Bye. Bye.